If you have atrial fibrillation, it is extremely important to protect yourself against having a stroke. People with atrial fibrillation are five times more at risk of having a stroke than someone who doesn't have AF. So how can atrial fibrillation lead to a stroke? Well, first of all, we need to understand atrial fibrillation. And in very, very simple terms, we have four chambers of the heart and normally they beat rhythmically. With atrial fibrillation, they may quiver. Some may beat, others may just be quivering. It's erratic, it's all over the place. And so the blood flow is irregular. And often a clot will form. And when that happens, that clot may break away from the heart and travel to the brain. Nine out of 10 strokes in people who have atrial fibrillation are caused by a blood clot, breaking off in the heart, traveling to the brain and blocking a vessel. That's called an ischemic stroke. These strokes can be very severe. They could kill you, but they could also leave you severely disabled. Because of this, we routinely recommend in patients with atrial fibrillation that they have treatment with an anticoagulant. For 50, 60 years, there's only been one anticoagulant available, warfarin. For some people, they tolerate warfarin very well and it certainly reduces their risk of stroke. However, for many, as with any drugs, it's not suitable for all. Warfarin is a drug that tends to interact with other drugs and with food. And so we have to be very careful about the exact dose of warfarin that you need. In order to make the correct prescription, we have to test your blood every so often to see what the warfarin effect is. The result is called the INR, and it has to be between two and three. If it strays outside that range, we have to change the dose of warfarin to bring it back into that range. Now you can do this testing sometimes at home, sometimes in your doctor's surgery, and sometimes at the hospital, depending on what the setup is in your locality. But importantly, this test has to be done routinely and regularly. And you may have to change the dose of warfarin quite a lot. In order to prevent all these changes, it's wise to try and make sure that you avoid certain foods, such as foods containing vitamin K. Those foods are things like spinach, kale, cauliflower, many of the green-leaved vegetables. It's also important to avoid interactions with alcohol and interactions with some fruit juice, like grapefruit juice. And then there are many drugs which are prescribed for all sorts of things that interfere with the way that warfarin is used in the body. And they may increase or decrease the level of warfarin and therefore the INR. Now, great news that new anticoagulants have come to market and these anticoagulants do not need to be monitored with regular blood tests. The novel oral anticoagulants are given in fixed dosages because they're not so susceptible to any changes with drugs. In fact, they don't interact with food at all. And so we can be much more certain of exactly the dose that is needed for you. Compared with warfarin, the novel oral anticoagulants have all shown that they are either better than or equivalent to warfarin with regard to the reduction of stroke or something called systemic embolism, which is a blood clot going to another organ in the body. And similarly, all of these novel oral anticoagulants reduce the likelihood of bleeding in the brain. And that, of course, is one of the most severe complications of anticoagulant treatment. And it's much less with the new or novel oral anticoagulants than it is with warfarin or other vitamin K antagonist treatments. For patients, having a choice of oral anticoagulation so that they can lead their lives as they want and not have to worry about what they eat, what they drink, will make such a difference. 
you should speak to your doctor about the exact risks and benefits of each anticoagulant and then decide between you which is best for you.